Coming up on 2020 on ID. Two New England towns, two local girls who will never grow old. It's heartbreaking. It's almost like a 19-year funeral. What happened to 14-year-old Melanie? There are people who know where she is. Was her hometown harboring secrets and suspects? Getting drunk and hooting and hollering once in a while doesn't make you a killer. And who preyed on 13-year-old Kathy? Decades later, would a stranger finally give police a clue? He had something that had been weighing on him for 30 plus years. Two cold cases finally getting hot. We're the closest we've ever been in this investigation. Two families still haunted by the ghosts of Otto. Welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. Sometimes a crime that's unsolved lingers in your consciousness. You can't let go of it. In this hour, the stories of two girls who disappeared, each on a chilly fall night, leaving few clues behind. Their loss deeply affected the small towns they came from, where many knew the victim, the family, or maybe even the perpetrator. As Elizabeth Vargas first reported in 2009, decades later, the search for answers was far from over. It is Halloween season in New England, and the quiet streets of Woburn, Massachusetts are decorated with the ghosts and goblins that are the stuff of children's nightmares. But this year, the town is haunted by the 20th anniversary of a macabre local mystery that is terrifyingly real. The sudden disappearance of a pretty young girl in these dense woods on the outskirts of town. Molly walked down the path to meet her girlfriends and other, other kids that were uh, so, several years older than her. That was the last time that she was seen. That was 20 years ago. 14-year-old Melanie Melanson was the youngest of a dozen kids gathered in these woods that October night. Most of the older teens had been here many times before. It's just like a keg of beer, you know, maybe a couple of loose cases of beers thrown around, a nice big fire out in the woods. It was nothing out of the ordinary. We did this every, every weekend. Kids would come around and they would hang out and, um, and, and, and drink. Drink, smoke? Any drugs being done? Um, I'm sure there was there was some there was some uh, marijuana. Uh... Detective Mike Pandolf and prosecutor yeah. Marion Ryan have been part of the police investigation of this case since the very beginning. She was a freshman in high school, very flattered to be invited out here. It's October, freshman year, very flattered to be out here with the older kids. Her Ball, birthday was very, coming. Yeah, up. Her birthday was coming. Um, she was getting her braces off the next <laughs> week. All kinds wow. of things that were all very exciting. But at some point that night, Melanie's excitement turned to horror. Her family and the police are convinced she never left these woods alive. It's heartbreaking to feel that she's out there. We know she's out there. And we just want to put her precious little head on a, a little pillow and cover, cover her with a blanket. And, you know, it's, it's really heartbreaking. Just always wanted to believe that she was going to come back. And there's still a part of me that really wishes that she would just show up. But uh, we all kind of know that that's not what we're dealing with. In the fall of 1989, when Melanie Melanson disappeared, America had a new president, the first George Bush. China had been rocked by the Tiananmen protests and the Berlin Wall was coming down. But the world outside Woburn seemed very far away to Melanie, a vivacious 14-year-old cheerleader beloved for her sense of fun. At the time, Millie Vanilli was big. And we used to sing their songs and make up dance routines. We had big hair and, you know, now I'm an adult and I just look back and I'm like, wow, we were just so young. Melanie was a very outgoing little girl, young girl, very happy little girl, had the biggest dimples you ever saw. She was always at a smile on her face, 
and never really let anything get her down. Excited to be a freshman in high school? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she was a joy. Life hadn't always been easy for Melanie. Her parents were both substance abusers who fought constantly. Melanie had even run away from home before going to live with her Aunt Marianne and her grandmother in this apartment in Woburn. She'd had a bit of a, a challenge in life thus far. Now, Melanie had a challenging upbringing, but it wasn't without people who loved her. You know, she had cousins, aunts, and it was a, a very nice upbringing, despite her own biological parents having problems. On the afternoon of Friday, October 27th, just days before Melanie's 15th birthday, Melanie and her friend Carmen left high school after class. The two walked home until they parted for the last time. We split off right right here. She was going home to her grandmother's house and um, you know she continued on through through the field. But this was the last place I saw her. That night, Melanie told her grandmother she was going to sleep over with a friend who lived just next door. What Melanie didn't say was that she'd been invited to join that late night gathering in the woods next to this industrial park. And the thing is, it's so, it's so kind of remote out here that it's really not going to bother anyone. You know, there's no neighbors to complain about kids being loud. Good for a party, not so good if you're in trouble. Other kids at the party would later tell police that the gathering slowly dwindled down in the early hours of Saturday morning and everyone drifted home. But when dawn broke, Melanie was nowhere to be found. My mom called me the following morning and said to me, Melanie didn't come home last night, and she's not at her girlfriend's house that she was supposed to be sleeping over. Did you begin at that point calling all of her friends' houses to see if she was there? Yeah. Her grandmother stopped by my, my house, um, which was literally right down the street um, from where she lived, to see if Melanie had slept over. Or she had been there or whatever because she didn't come home that night and um, I said she wasn't here. Melanie had planned a shopping trip with her father to buy fringe leather boots for her birthday but by mid-afternoon she was still missing. Her family then learned about the party and made a series of frantic phone calls to almost everyone who had been there. And they all told you what? That she was with so-and-so. So I went to so-and-so. And so-and-so said, no, she wasn't here with me. She was last with this individual. Went back to that individual, no. Did you start to feel like you were getting the runaround? Most definitely, mm -hmm. I did. Mm -hmm. Melanie's family contacted the Woburn Police Department and reported Melanie missing. 743, go ahead. There was little sense at first that the case would become an obsession that would last for decades. The police initially thought she'd simply run away because she had run away before. When Melanie went missing, there were some theories about why she might have gone missing. But there were people from day one who were very committed and dedicated to finding her and who were suspicious about how she might have gone missing. We knew that day that something had to have happened to Melanie. She would have called one of us. Within days, police had focused their attention on two young men who had been at the party and who police believe were the last to be seen with Melanie. When we come back, what happened in the woods? At the end of the night, it went five boys to Melanie and two boys to Melanie. And after 20 years, would someone finally come forward? I don't know how anyone can keep that secret for that long. Stay with us. Melanie Melanson was just days short of her 15th birthday when she vanished without a trace. Although the police had very little to work with, they never let the case go. In fact, for many people, it was impossible to forget what had happened. The mystery haunted the town. Once again, Elizabeth Vargas. <laughs> Halloween season has an eerie overlay in Woburn, Massachusetts. That's the time of year high school freshman Melanie Melanson disappeared after attending a party in these woods. It is a case police say is now suddenly very active after having gone cold for nearly 20 years.
As police searched for answers in Melanie's case, the most talked about show on television was the mysterious Twin Beaks, a surreal series about a town haunted by the unsolved murder of a beautiful young cheerleader. The Misty Woburn Post were wrestling with was strikingly similar and all too real. The family immediately think she also was dead or did they continue to hold out hope? There was hope that maybe she had run away. There was hope that she had gone to a friend's home that evening, that she'd be home later the next day. But hope turned to suspicion, and suspicion turned to heartbreak as the days became weeks and weeks became months. So what kind of manhunt took place? Everything from cadaver dogs to helicopter searches. They scoured the woods. They scoured the nearby bodies of water. Everything available to law enforcement was utilized. What are you hoping for during a grid search like that? Trying to find her, knowing that when you find her, it's not going to be a good thing. It's heartbreaking. It's hard to describe. Police eventually zeroed in on the last people said to be with Melanie when the party in the woods broke up in the hours before dawn. How late are we talking? Between 1 and 4 a.m. was a time when she was last seen with her friends. And you know, best we know, at the end of the night, it went five boys and Melanie and two boys and Melanie. One of those two boys was Jim Tresca, who was 17 years old in 1989. He says he was hauled in for questioning two days after Melanie disappeared in what would be the first of many confrontations with police. I was 17 years old. They take me to some state police barracks, threatening to beat the tar out of me if I don't tell them what they want to know. You know, real aggressive, you know what I mean? Tresca told the police that he left the party around 3 in the morning with a few stragglers, but Melanie wanted to stay. The party was winding down, and I offered everybody a ride home that was left at the party. She didn't want to ride. She wanted to stay behind with a friend of mine, so I drove everybody home. I went back down to the woods to make sure the fire was out, which it still wasn't, because I guess they were still out in the woods, and I went home. Tresca says Melanie stayed behind with this man, Gene Bertini, who was 16 at the time and was rumored to be having a relationship with Melanie. He would only comment to 2020 through his lawyer, Ed McCormick. Gene's statement is that when he left of the party 20 years ago, uh, Miss Melanson was alive and that there were at least one other, and I don't know how many other people still at the party when he left. They both said that the other guy was the last one with her, didn't they? The other guy was the last one to see her that evening, not me. For nearly 20 years, Jim Tresca and Jean Bertini have stuck to their stories. They and others who were at the party have stayed in the area, and most have started families of their own. Some now have children close to Melanie's age when she disappeared. And all the while, the police suspect more than one of them has harbored terrible secrets. Now, we have reason to believe that more than one person over the years has not only concealed Melanie's body, but may also be involved in further concealing it or even moving it. Melanie's family also believes that somebody who was at the party knows more than they're telling. Are you amazed that nobody's cracked in all these years and spilled the secret? It amazes me is how they can live with themselves. I don't know how anyone could keep a secret for 20 years especially having to get up in the morning and look at themselves in a mirror or face a wife or children or mother. I don't know how anyone could keep that secret for that long. Over the years, rumors have emerged in this small town that Melanie was seen that night walking in this parking lot through this darkened neighborhood and down this street toward the next town. There were also whispers that Jim Tresca and Jean Bertini had conspired together to make sure Melanie was never found. My name's basically like mud throughout the whole town, you know what I mean? I don't even, I try not to even go to Woburn anymore. I get this guy on the internet saying that he's gonna kill me. So now I'm a parent, I don't even wanna walk outside. It's just, it's hard, it's a horrible way to live. For Melanie's family too, the pain has been vast. Her beloved grandmother died after years of wondering what happened to her Melanie. Her family says she never got over it. My mother was in the hospital in the end. 
and every single day. Is there any news about Melanie? And this was how long after she disappeared? My mother passed away. Melanie had been gone for almost 15 years. Mm -hmm. And what about Melanie's parents? They've both since passed away. And from the day that Melanie disappeared, they were devastated. It's the hardest thing in the world to live with, knowing that your daughter is gone. And you cannot begin to heal because you have this hole in your heart. It's almost like a 19-year funeral. But in all those years, the family has never given up, and neither have the police. Detective Mike Pandolf has chased leads and returned to the scene of the crime many times over the years. And in 2009, authorities announced a renewed push to solve the case. We urge anyone with information about Melanie. Offering a $5,000 reward for new information that led to Melanie. Finally, investigators returned to the woods, acting, they said, on new information they had just received. It's very encouraging what has happened in the last few days. The area being searched is fenced off to the public. It is deep in the woods, about 1,000 feet from where Melanie was last seen. You know, we're watching it on the news. It gives me goosebumps, because I'm like, they're looking for my friend's body. And it's just, it's just so hard. It's just a chat. I think about her laying out there someplace, and I know she's just bones and cold. It's horrible. It's horrible. 20 years after Melanie disappeared, police believe that the secrets may be slipping out. When we come back... We're very encouraged by the search, and um, I think we're the closest we've ever been in this investigation. Stay with us. Two decades after the disappearance of Melanie Melanson, the two men who allegedly were the last to see her alive are still living under a cloud. Did they do something to Melanie, or are they victims themselves of this unsolved crime? Once again, Elizabeth Vargas. Over the past 20 years, Jim Tresca and Jean Bertini have had a long series of run-ins with the law. Yeah, I said I had a bad night. In October 2009, Jim Tresca was arraigned in the town of Lowell, Massachusetts. What? All right. On charges of domestic abuse against his girlfriend. James Tresca. <laughs> oh, I don't even really remember what happened. But I started drinking, started drinking whiskey, and then, I don't know, I just kind of blacked out. Upon arriving, they found the defendant in the, in the apartment, and he was highly intoxicated. Every time I've ever, like, drank hard booze, Something horrible's always happened to me. Tresca entered a plea of not guilty, but it is far from the first time he's appeared before a judge. His criminal record is pages and decades long. The charges range from fishing without a license to assault and battery. The assault and batteries that I got, though, it's not like it wasn't on a woman or anything, you know what I mean? Well, this time, yeah, me and my girlfriend, I, I, I don't even really remember what happened, but I mean, the assault and batteries that I got, I got when I was a kid. You know, a fight in a parking lot at a McDonald's, you know what I mean? Doesn't make me guilty of murder, you know what I mean? Getting drunk and hooting and hollering once in a while doesn't, doesn't make you a killer. While Jim Tresca sat in jail awaiting a hearing in the domestic abuse case, his childhood friend Jean Bertini was confined under house arrest on a probation violation after repeated convictions for drunk driving. His lawyer says Jean has a problem with alcohol, but is innocent in the disappearance of Melanie Melanson. On each and every occasion that he has run afoul of the law, it's been alcohol related. But there's nothing whatsoever in his criminal record that is even associated with any violent crime, any kidnapping, or any type of sex crime whatsoever. And the truth is that after 20 years, neither Jim Tresca nor Jean Bertini has ever been charged with anything in the disappearance of Melanie. The police will not even describe them officially as suspects. 
is it possible that both boys left her alone in the woods that night? Maybe something happened to her, an accidental death, that nobody is guilty of doing something to Melanie? If it was an accidental death, then you would have found the body. The fact that we haven't found the body leads us to believe it has been concealed. And there are people in the Woburn area who know where she is. They've been focused on one or two individuals for 20 years and the case hasn't resolved that might tell you that there's a reason it hasn't resolved because mr bertini wasn't involved it's like a witch hunt they're just obsessed with the fact that me and a friend of mine did something to this girl which we never did and it's just been harassment for 20 years the authorities will not reveal what if anything was found during their search in the woods and jim tresco's testimony before a grand jury remains undisclosed still police are hopeful that the case will soon be closed Everyone touched by Melanie's disappearance says an end to their torment cannot come quickly enough. I've just always been cooperative. You know what I mean? Anything to help them get closure, I've done. And if there was more that I could do, I would. I just, I don't know. You know what I mean? I just don't know. My heart breaks for our family. I miss her. I miss her. I'm doing anything for her. Is it enough just to find her body? Is it, can you live with not knowing what happened and who for did me, it? it would be. Really, just to find her body would be enough for you? Mm-hmm. How about you? For now it is, for now we just do want to bring her home. In another New England town, just 80 miles away, another family, like Melanie Melanson's, is haunted by a missing loved one. In our hearts you live on, our memories and love will never cease. Until we meet again, Kathy, we love you. Yeah. On a summer day, residents of Franklin, New Hampshire came together for a vigil to mark the disappearance of 13-year-old Kathy Glotty. She was full of wonderment. She was always looking at things and trying to figure things out. You know, she was just amazing, a cool little kid. I've been working on a lot of photos for the vigil, did a board. Her face is so fresh in my mind. I lost it. I totally lost it. I mean, I just, Janet was hugging me. I, I just was sobbing. Her family's emotions are still raw. But the fact is, almost four decades after Kathy Glotty's disappearance, Police say this mystery is just beginning to come into focus. You just call my name. Kathy disappeared in 1971. This James Taylor song was a hit that year. The war in Vietnam dominated foreign news. At home, Charles Manson and three co-defendants were convicted of a murder rampage in the Hollywood Hills. Franklin, New Hampshire, with a population of only 6,700, seemed to be far away from all that violence and danger. You know, 1971 and what it was like in your town, and you know, people felt safe. Oh, yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Everybody knew everybody. You know, nobody locked, locked their doors. Anywhere. No. no. I was never afraid until Kathy. That changed everything. And, and everybody in town. Yeah. The story that would alter a whole community began on an ordinary afternoon in late November. Kathy Glotty went to a local store for ice cream and a walk across this bridge. Along with her was her constant companion, a German shepherd named Tasha. By nightfall, Kathy hadn't returned and hadn't called her family to tell them where she was. I knew that that wasn't her personality, to not let you know or not come home. Her family's worry turned to panic when Tasha came home alone. That dog climbed up on the door and was clawing at the door, just scratching at the door to get in. Standing up on two legs. Yes. I let the dog in. The dog ran around that house. Her dog was searching for her, definitely. What time was that? And that was probably about 20 past 10 that night. And I remember the look on mom's face. She was crying and she said, something terrible has happened and i looked at her and i said mom don't say that you know it's probably it's probably nothing but in your mind you're thinking this is so wrong something yeah. is definitely wrong yeah 
that night. We called the friends, we called the neighbors, you know, yeah. all night long. Karen went out with Dad in the car searching. Did any of your family sleep that first night? Mm -mm. No. No. No, we were up all night. We did call the police. They said, well, we can't really do anything for 24 hours. Kathy's family would learn the next day that during their sleepless night, Kathy's lifeless and naked body had been left in a patch of woods a mile and a half away. What police said had been done to her sent shivers through the town and heartbreak through the family. And uh, to think that she was left there, you know, in the cold of a dark winter's night and with no clothes on. And what had happened to her just, it came crashing down. It was really hard. That was a hard thing. I mean, this was yeah. beyond barbaric. I just don't even know how somebody could be that brutal. No. The mystery of who murdered 13-year-old Kathy Glotty left police without a suspect for decades. But that was about to change when we come back. He said, I think I need to be arrested because I killed somebody. Was this the man who murdered Kathy? We didn't know his background until years down the road. What a wicked man he was. Stay with us. For almost four decades, how Kathy Glotty died or who killed her remained a mystery. Kathy's sisters, Janet and Karen, were just teenagers themselves back in 1971, but the pain has never gone away. Once again, Elizabeth Vargas. Autumn brings a chilling memory for many residents of Franklin, New Hampshire. That's the season when police discover the body of 13-year-old Kathy Glotty in these woods, just a day after she disappeared from her family. And where were you when you got the call from police that they had found her? They came to the house. Kathy's sister Janet, then 18 years old, was home when police came. Their sister Karen, then 15, walked in on the scene. And I just stood in the doorway and I said, what's wrong? What's the matter? And Janet blurted out, you know, they found Kathy and she's, she's dead. She's been murdered. And I remember going off into the kitchen by myself and just sobbing in a corner. Just put my face in a corner and just sobbed. <laughs> it is a heartbreaking mystery that is just now unraveling as police have refocused on a murder that happened 38 years ago. Riders on the storm There's a killer on the road It was a time whose darker tones were captured in the Doors song, Riders on the Storm. The gritty French connection was 1971's Oscar-winning Best Picture. In that movie, the bad guys were quickly in sights of hard detectives from the big city. In the small town of Franklin, New Hampshire, he's had little experience with a murder as shocking as Kathy Glotty's. It's one of the most heinous crimes that I've encountered in my 31 years of professional experience. Former police chief Tom Shamshack now heads a group of private detectives working pro bono for Kathy's family. Kathy Glotty's body was discovered here on her back, clothed only in a pair of knee socks. A hunter coming through the area initially suspected that this was a, a, a deer carcass. This was a, a savage killing, raped, head wound, strangled, and then run over four times by an automobile. The question is why would somebody overkill here this was uh, a lot of rage i mean that's not what you expect you know especially in a little town like that that would have been the last thing any of us would have thought of that she had been brutal you know brutally raped and murdered when did the police tell you the details we knew that it was terrible and then it was kind of trickled in um how terrible it was what was done to Kathy Glotty terrified the tight-knit community? Who could have so savagely killed a young girl? She was of good character. Uh, she was loved by her family, was never in any kind of trouble. Um, suspicion did focus on several individuals 
adult men in the community. And as the years went by, suspicion would cling to those same several men. But whatever secrets they held were never uncovered. This case would have been solved if that crime happened today, um, given modern forensic techniques. Kathy, in this case, was raped, and there was semen left behind. DNA samples would have been obtained from all of the suspects that the police had, and it would have been very quick to determine who the actual perpetrator was. New Hampshire Senior Assistant Attorney General Will Delker notes that in 1971, DNA evidence was unheard of. Crime scene procedures were more primitive, and cases were less easily closed. This is no one's fault. It's just the reality of um, technology as it existed almost 40 years ago. One officer said there were a lot of mistakes made in the case in 1971. I'm not going to lie to you. He said, but they did the best that they could with what they had. As Kathy's murder went unsolved year after year after year, there was a mounting cost to her family. How did your parents react in the years that followed? They were never the same. No. The toll that it took on them was just awful to watch as a child growing yeah. up. You just did whatever you could to try to ease their pain. I, yeah. I know I remember, you know, don't cry around them. Don't talk about it around them. You know, we kept a lot inside because we just didn't want to upset them, you know? And so that's the way your childhood was. It was hard. And then, of course, after your dad died, mm -hmm. your mom committed suicide. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that happened? She said she just, she missed Kathy. And as kids, it hurt tremendously that she had done that because you think, how could she do that and leave you behind? You know, and it took me a while to get over that. The murder that became a double tragedy for Kathy Glotty's family may have been a crime that predated modern CSI techniques, but 38 years later, authorities say they're getting close to solving it the old-fashioned way. Many of these cold cases are solved because people come forward and say, I know something. And recently, people have been coming forward, and um, some of that information that they've been providing has, in fact, been valid, reliable information. One lead the police have been examining is the man who shared a house with the Glotties. Ed Duquette lived in an apartment above the Glotti family in their two family homes. He had lived there with his wife and young child. And occasionally, Kathy or one of the other sisters would be asked to babysit. I always thought he was a strange man, but I didn't feel, un you know, uncomfortable with him. Until Karen now says something happened in Duquette's apartment. I was babysitting, and at that time, he made an attempt on me. What did he do? He carried me to his bed, and he, you know, tried to sexually molest me. How old were you? I was uh, thir 13. But I was able to run away, and the thing is, I didn't tell anybody. You didn't tell? No. 1971, you didn't talk about those things if something happened to you. You know, it just wasn't done. So you live with it, and you keep it inside for the rest of your life. Two years later, when Kathy was murdered, her older sister Karen didn't connect it with her buried memory. By then, Ed Duquette had moved out and moved on. We didn't know his background until years down the road. What a wicked man he was. Authorities would later learn that Ed Duquette resurfaced in California, where he lured another young girl with the prospect of babysitting. Once she arrived at the apartment, there was no babysitting job. Uh, instead, um, over the course of uh, more than a day, he kept her confined to that apartment, uh, physically abused her, and uh, raped her repeatedly over the course of that time. And then, um, ultimately, uh, she was allowed to leave, and um, uh, she reported that to, the, to her mother and ultimately the police. With a warrant out for his arrest, Duquette fled California, Police would only later learn that he returned to New Hampshire just before 13-year-old Kathy Glotty's rape and murder, a fact that eluded early investigators on the case. Nobody had uh, connected the dots about Ed Duquette 
They had no uh, knowledge of his prior violent history with the, uh, the California case. And there was some confusion about where Ed Duquette was when Kathy uh, was murdered. They may have been mistaken about the fact and believed that he was not in the state at the time. You know, we now believe that he was. And there are several witnesses who placed him in New Hampshire in November and December. Kathy Glotty was murdered in November of 1971. Twelve years later, police took another crack at the case and a closer look at Ed Duquette. In 1983, when the case was reactivated, he was viewed as a, as a person of interest, but there was no physical evidence in 1983 to link Ed Duquette to Kathy Glotty's murder. There wasn't enough to make an arrest at that time. And we have information that others could have been involved. Um, we can't ignore that information. Kathy's family has lived in a town full of rumors and whispers about possible suspects, but with no real answers. Is she still very much there for you? Is this crime still an open wound? Oh, no. yes. Definitely. Definitely. Knowing she didn't die right away. That's yeah. probably, that's really hard to live with. I mean, we finally found out that she was repeatedly raped, you know, so we know she fought for her life. We're the one that's uh, crying for her, for justice. A case that haunted this small New Hampshire town finally got a major break from 10 states away. A police officer in Florida had information for New Hampshire State Police Sergeant Scott Gilbert. Information about a man who came in off the street. And he walked into the Dixie County Sheriff's Department and he indicated that he needed to be arrested. He needed to be arrested for a murder in New Hampshire about 30 years ago. New Hampshire authorities take off for Florida. Did they finally have their man? When we come back... Oh, you did this with a girl fishing and something happened. Do you remember the name of the girl? It was Claude and Glotty. Stay with us. On a March morning in Florida, the last thing officers from the Dixie County Police Department expected was to solve a New Hampshire murder case more than three decades old. But it looked like that was what was happening when a local Florida man walked in and spoke with Major Dean Miller. He said, I think I need to be arrested because I killed somebody. Inside the department headquarters, Major Miller recorded the man's statement. State your full name and date of birth, please. And you check. And you came to get something off your mind that's been bothering you for 30 years and it involves the death in New Hampshire. Do you remember the name of the girl? It was Claude Glotty. Was her first name Kathy? Yes. I paused him at that time and I called New Hampshire. At that point, did you think, finally, we're going to get justice? Yeah, and I think the police did, too. And we really felt that he would be the one that would tell the whole story. But the story Ed Duquette was spinning in Florida ultimately made little sense. Oh, you did this little girl fishing, and something happened, and I found a little girl in, in the water. He was jumping all around the truth, but wasn't quite telling it. Ed Duquette never came out and explicitly said, I murdered Kathy Glotty. He admitted to being the last one with her, and then he said the next thing he realized, she was dead. He became numb and afraid and put her body in the trunk and drove away. There's something not job here with what you're telling me and what, what's fact. I just don't remember. Well, why would you not tell her parents that she possibly drowned or she fell? If an accident happened, sure, it'd be, it'd be a traumatic thing and it'd be fearful, but you would, 28 years old, surely you would think to get her some help. I can't explain myself. I can't I have any explanation about the things that I've done and the evil that I've done to other people. I just don't know. 
What police hoped was a sure thing turned out to be a jumble of recollections that didn't match all the facts of the case. And there was a bigger bombshell waiting in Florida when they interviewed Ed Duquette. He then, I don't want to say recanted, but backtracked on some of uh, the statements he said by claiming that the admissions to being involved in this murder were a result of the medication. An ailing Ed Duquette told the medication from a recent spinal tap had made him confused. And so it essentially becomes building the entire case again uh, from scratch against him. Investigators building that case established a possible motive for the extreme brutality of Kathy's murder. We know now Kathy Glotty's father had served as a member of a jury that convicted Ed Duquette's father of statutory rape. Another fact is my father evicts him from the house. Now you've got a father and a son angry at my dad. Investigators thought that anger may have fueled the rage displayed in Kathy's brutal rape and murder. And police say they had formulated the right questions to finally break Ed Duquette. We were on our way back down to Florida and we actually had the plane tickets in our hand when we found out that Ed Duquette had passed away. 66-year-old Ed Duquette, suffering from both lung and liver ailments, died in hospice care. In his later years, he had found religion and had a copy of the Ten Commandments on the lawn in front of his Florida trailer. Police think when he walked in off the street that day, he was a dying man looking for redemption. He had something that had been weighing on him that he wanted to get off his chest uh, but not so much that it would uh, it cost him being incarcerated. He thought, I'm going to die, and I'm at least going to make enough right to make, to make myself feel better. Now I can go to heaven. Kathy Glotty's family, who left this cross near where her body was found, say even if Ed Duquette were guilty, he may not have acted alone, and others who may have been involved still live in town. How does the unfinished part of this story affect a family? Well, we're not going to give up. No. You know, I mean, that's something we decided as a family. We're her voice. <laughs>